All right, uh, welcome. Uh, this is Blogspot. I'm Kimberly Lewis. I'm the creator of this program. I'm Amy Flagg. I'm an educator here in Middle Tennessee. Um, Blogspot is a program that we created for STEM education. So what is it and why do you care? So, uh, it, is, well, it is a STEM education program and it's grades 5 through 12 here in Nashville, but we want to start in middle school and we want to end your senior year of high school. You're going to start, you're going to earn your very own kit, so you're going to earn your own Arduino kit, you're going to earn whatever it winds up being, and you start with Lego as a building material, and by the time you're in your senior year, you're making your own parts. You're machining your own parts from metal, you're making them out of wood, you're using, what, you're using a 3D printer. Found printed. objects. Yeah, whatever you happen to get your hands on. Uh, car, if you want to make a cardboard robot, make a cardboard robot. That'd be awesome. But the idea is that by the time you graduate high school, you're prepared to enter the workforce, a technical program, or any or an apprenticeship, and do so in such a way that you can join any technological program out there in the, in the, city, the uh, city of Nashville. So why do you care? Middle class, uh, so if we're talking about the class system, middle class families, their parents are generally working fewer hours. The kids live in a richer neighborhood. They go to a better school. And that's because of property tax. They are told from a very young age they can do anything, they can be anything, they have a bright future. And therefore, they have more college opportunities. And this is the most important part. They are more likely to continue this on with their children. That way, this is a, it's a cycle that continues a family through, um, through middle class. And unlike other systems, it's, you're not, without a serious catastrophic failure, you're not going to see that change too much. <clears throat> Unfortunately, if you're a poorer student, both parents are often working 50 plus hours per week if they can, they live in a poorer neighborhood, and therefore they have fewer property taxes, and they're going to go to a less well-funded school. They're not going to be encouraged by their environment to continue to go into these into into these kinds of careers. Therefore, they're going to have fewer opportunities for higher education, and they're likely to continue that cycle because if they're going into a poor environment, they're going to be able to afford less expensive housing and put their kids into poorer schools. Well, not only that, there's just less opportunity. Um, mom and dad are not around and, and able to support kids and are, are not interested in their interests, then they're not going to, going to gain the education that a child whose parents are trying to cultivate them well. Um, I read a book recently, there are really only two types of parenting styles. There was a sociologist that went to several families and ask that for 20 of them to just, or 30, to just allow the sociologist to follow them around. Said, pretend we're the family dog. We're going to church with you, we're gonna to go to the ball field with you, we're gonna follow you to the grocery store. They figured they'd see several different types of parenting, but in reality, there's two. Middle class and upper class have a attitude of cultivation. We're going to find what our child is interested in, we're going to help them find some interest, and we're going to build those. Poverty people don't do that. I mean, part of it is because they're so busy and there's so few resources. Um, the other thing is they have a notion of childhood should be about kids just being kids. And so they go out in the backyard, they <coughs> climb trees, they create games. It's a beautiful experience, but they don't have the advantages that a child that's in a middle and upper class would that's cultivated and has those opportunities put in front of them. Uh, in the Nashville Metro School System, unfortunately, 80% of all students are on lunch assistance of some variety, either assisted or free lunch. And uh, the New York Times has found that Nashville is among the 40 poorest cities in America. So this is not going to be changing anytime soon. And yet, we have people like um, Brad Paisley. We have some of the richest musicians in the country living here. So we have a pretty major disparity between rich and poor in this city. 
And if that kind of divide is continuing in this city the way it is in the rest of the country, that's just going to get worse. It's heartbreaking. Poorly performing schools uh, doubled in Nashville last year, according to the Tennessean. So if we're talking no child left behind, they scored more, they scored worse last year. Most of the schools scored worse than they had the year before. And 40% of all teachers quit within the first five years. So as a general rule of thumb, we're not doing well as a city with our, with our education. We're actually doing very poorly. We're falling apart. And we're hoping to change that. And uh, Amy is in charge of our curriculum. I, one of the things I learned very young, and it's a very important thing, is to know what you know and know what you don't know. I know a lot of things about programming. I know a lot of things about what is a lot of fun to do, like, say, building robots out of Legos. I don't know anything about education, and therefore, I am a smart enough person to say, this is somebody who's worked in education for 15 years. Let's ask her to do this. She knows what she's talking about. <laughs> I was really privileged to be requested to be on this team. And this started at a hack. So I'm very pro-hack. This was a Hack Tennessee function. And we had 40 different teams around the room, people that pitched different ideas. And she pitched the idea of building robots. And I'm so there. Love robotics. I taught the best robotics team at my school. And it's just been amazing. And so I thought, well, OK, how are we going to scaffold kids for success? And to me, if you're going to do robotics, the first thing is understanding the brain of these things. And so we're going to talk about microcontrollers as one of our, our stems from this. Uh, we're going to start with Makey Makey. Makey Makey was the first thing that we worked with. It's so good because you don't have to actually put programming into it. The programming is basically already there. It's a small little red board like this with places to plug in. And you can plug it in and pull up their website and then the buttons become whatever it is you've downloaded from that. And so, very simple. My son figured it out at the same hack. And so we were, while we were creating this amazing thing, he was building, like building a little controller for Mario out of bananas. So we had a, a line of 20 adults line up, and first he did a, pana a piano, Try saying that five times fast. Banana piano. Uh, we, but we had a pi a, 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 can't, can't do it. Not tonight. It's too late. <laughs> so he had this this piano that he built, and then he rewired it, and just as quickly created a Minecraft controller. And so he was able to to show all of these adults in the room. This is something that a child could do. My daughter got involved with it. They were playing with microcontrollers all weekend long. I said, that's where we start. And then I was thinking we would move to the Arduino, but that was before I learned about pickaxe. So I'm still in the process of building that scaffold. How do we help kids who know absolutely nothing go from here, learn what a microcontroller is, do something with a microcontroller that works, and then build them up so that they're able to program more advanced things. So a pickaxe may be my middle of the line, because they're like 10 bucks. Arduinos are like 40, but I learned, I met someone last night who showed me how to build those. Cool. So uh, we may actually end up building our own Arduino boards. Uh, Raspberry Pi is another thing that we were looking at for these. When you pair a Pi, it's almost like putting a brain with a, a nervous system. You can make something very intelligent and very capable, at least capable enough of taking out the trash, which is kind of one of my goals at home, to get one that just wheels the trash out, follows the line, so I never have to do it again. So I'm in the process of learning myself, and it's an awful lot of fun. So we're going to teach, um, along with this, an introduction to programming. The beauty of this is that we're taking engineering, which is what kids do anyway. If a child has nothing else to do, and you set them in a corner with a box of rocks, they're going to figure out how to stack them as high as they can without them falling over. They're going to build a bridge out of them. Build a bridge out of them. Um, and anything that they can like that, and when you do the engineering, you're going to be able to bring in other STEM disciplines, like tech, like mathematics. When you're working with Arduino, one of the languages that you're dealing with is C++, and so that's going to be a great way to give kids an introduction of what does C look like. And then we're going to have a whole 
other strand that's programming. Python's one of my passions. I'm learning it. I'm going to use the Pi Tennessee curriculum. It's open source. I've already rewritten it. I've used it in Pi Ohio. We used a little bit of it this weekend. It was a it was a great success. And um, pseudocode, I'm not as familiar with. So pseudocode is a catch-all language, and what it means is it's is it's a way of planning how to code anything. And it's saying this is the concept behind which we're building this code. And if you can learn pseudocode, you can learn how to plan out, how to program anything. So the other thing that was really important, and this is important to me, is the most important thing I learned at National Software School was how to learn a new programming language. And that's one of the things we want to learn. As a result, I can go anywhere and I can read the documentation for a language and understand the basics of how to use it. So we're covering almost every STEM discipline with this. You've got engineering, you've got math, you've got technology. The only thing that we're lacking and we're going to figure out how to bring it in is a little bit of science. Um, we do get covered the engineering and design process, which really is just good play. Um, if you grew up like I did pre-computers, you were probably doing things like, you know, I was obsessed with building a flying machine. Tim Edson and I were constantly trying to build the quintessential mm -hmm. flying machine. We launched it off the slide. We got in trouble when we tried to launch it off the roof. Mm -hmm. um, but this is really the process that a child goes through when they're playing and investigating. We may have to reteach kids how to do this, and so we have this available. First you start, you investigate what the problem is. I want to build a flying machine. You design something that works. Our bars was built with umbrellas. Um, create it, and then evaluate it. And hopefully there's an adult around to say, no, you will not jump off the roof of that. But um, this process is something, though, that we see they're using it in various programs around the city to help with that engineering process. I used it when I taught robotics. It's really very helpful for dealing with all kinds of problems. So it's something that can translate over into success later. So, of course, we're covering basic engineering, I said in that. Um, we've got some electronics that are going to be part of Arduino course and the other breadboards and things like that. They'll have to understand positive and negative. They're going to have to understand how much load things can take before we blow them up. I mean, that's part of it. You blow some things up first, but hopefully we get the math enough to understand what things can take, why you need a capacitor, why you need the other various electronic components. Um, there's going to be physics in it, and of course mathematics, all part of this program, and none of it taught the way that schools teach right now. You know, we're not going to give them a test. Well, our test is going to be, can you build a device that blinks three lights and then makes a sound? Or can you build a robot that will roll across the floor? Can you build something that will come if I call it? You know, as we get into more and more advanced things. So it's going to be just merit. Can, can you produce these things that we're trying to produce? And if you can't, we're going to help you. So no failure. So it's such a good program, and I know that, that you would like to see kids have the opportunities to become the kind of hackers that you are, to be makers. And so you, you really want to play with Legos with this, too. I mean, it's just fun when you create these things and they do something that you never expected them to do. We spent the entire hack trying to figure out how to get the Dalek bot to work. And then we've oh, been no, 18 years, fine. 18 years, 18, 18 hours into this, felt like 18 years. And the day that it finally rolled, we all screamed and cheered as if we had landed on the moon. It was amazing. I want that for these kids. It's like best robotics, but I'm able to bring it to so many other students. So it makes me really happy. So how can you help us out? Well, uh, happy to see April be coming up this spring. And we're going to have another Blockspot team. So if you want to join up, show up and help us out. We need people who know basic electronics, basic programming, basic engineering. And we need people who are teachers, who understand about teaching, who are able to help us build this curriculum as we go. And help who can help us break down the component parts, because I don't know all of this yet. I'm in the process of building my skill set. I've been working on it for several years. But I haven't had any formal training in programming in Arduino and Arduino and the things that I've learned. So 
having people that understand it and have a teacher's heart to be able to say, here's the first level, here's the second level, and to help us scaffold these children's success. Uh, the other way is to donate. So you can donate items, uh, making Makey kits, Arduinos, electronics parts, and of course Legos. Uh, used Legos are fantastic because we can take these, we can put hot glue on them, and it won't damage the Lego. And we can also sterilize them, which is remarkably important. <laughs> uh, we also could use breadboards because we've learned last night that we can build some of the things that we need for a whole lot cheaper than going out and just buying an Arduino off, offline. So um, some of you may have breadboards at home that you're not using or may know somebody who like collects them. They, they buy one, they lose it in their house, they go out and they buy another one and they have 12. They might be willing to give us three. We would love that. Uh, the other thing is, and I always feel like it sounds crass to mention it, but money. The fact is we're trying to make this privately funded. If we ask for government funds, we're bound by No Child Left Behind, which if anybody knows, one of the largest opponents to No Child Left Behind is Mensa, which is a society of smart people. They are vehemently opposed to it. It's, it's a mistake. I was a kid, I got to experience school before it, and I got to experience school after it. And I will tell you, school after it deeply sucked. It's, it's not a whole lot of fun to teach under No Child Left Behind. Uh, almost every one that I've interviewed, if I've had a chance to ask them who it was in their background as a teacher that made a difference, it was someone that was passionate. It's very hard to be passionate about bubble test. I have yet to meet someone that is. It's, it's, just, it's just not there. You, know, you ask, you can walk up and ask somebody, please tell us your memory of your favorite bubble test. No, that's what they do, they laugh at me. So, um, yeah, we, we, we do want to be able to make this successful uh, for these kids and to, to divorce it from the way that they're teaching now. Hands on, real genuine opportunities, real genuine problems that, that we're actually answering and that sense of accomplishment that they get, where they're cheering and jumping up and down and excited about something that they generate. Uh, and the last one is help us find resources. It's mm -hmm. six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You all know somebody who knows somebody who can help us out. You know somebody who knows somebody who probably has a cache of Legos larger than anything that you could find in the Lego store. You probably know somebody who thinks this would be the coolest thing ever and is willing to give us 20 Arduinos. You probably hate your motors. Or, or, you know, go through their stuff and find scrap metal in their basement. You probably know somebody who's saying, hey, this is a really cool thing and I want to be part of it. So, that, so spread the word. Uh, the last one is Makerspace. So uh, our local Makerspace, we are, um, Make Nashville is creating, they're hoping that one of the largest Makerspaces in the U.S. is what they're thinking. And they, they, I love the way that they, they plan and they dream, but they are getting this thing off the ground. And if you have $100 that you're willing to toss their way, you can become a founder of our Makerspace. We have people who are willing to match the donations, and they want for this to be a part of their Makerspace. So that's pretty exciting to be able to partner with them. But it's also really important that we have a Makerspace. A great city should have one. They say we have one at the public library, but they won't let me in to come play because I'm over 18. So no, it's really not. Mm -hmm. um, and, as a, and the thing about it is that on top of that, as a society, a make, it's a maker space, and as a group of people, we want that ability to experiment. We want to be able to take our stuff and say, what can we do to play with this? And a society that's creating together is going to be a society that does some pretty cool things together. And it comes up with solutions. We're teaching kids how to think a different way because the way that they're working with them right now in school is really tamping down individuality. And we want to give them a place where they, they can have the freedom to play and expand. All right, so thank you for coming. Uh, I have our, these are our Twitter handles. I, I go by Stash Attack. I also go by The Stash Attacks, but unfortunately that's too long for Twitter. Uh, just about everywhere else. And uh, Amy has her, she goes by Amy Flat one on Twitter. Um, you can get a, get a hold of us there. You can get a hold of us in a lot of places. If you think this will be fun, we are really excited to work with everybody here. So thank you for attending. 
Thank you. Uh, are there any questions? All right. Thank you.